Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, with Sam Bankman Fried and Elizabeth Holmes in the news recently, we thought it might be interesting to take a look at the psychology of the scam artist. What kind of personality traits or experiences lead someone to engage? engage in fraud and deception. And how might we understand this from a a depth psychological view? So we're going to circumambulate this topic as we do and see what we can find out. Well, the first thing that strikes me is how we are so fascinated by these antisocial personality traits. It seems like every movie that I look at in Netflix, every television series, that there is either a glorification or a triumphal war with these kind of antisocial qualities. And sometimes we're cheering the tricksters on because we think that they're, Mm -hmm. you know, coming up against some despotic government they have to overturn, or we're cheering somebody on as they're warring against the trickster evil in the world. But this polarity of tricking and scamming and stealing and antisocial behavior is something we can't seem to get enough of in our own culture. I wonder in a way if uh, we're uh, thinking about the polarity around the hero. That, you know, on the one hand, we have the shining knight, but on the other hand, we have these sort of aberrant heroes like, like Jesse James and some other people who sort of do it their way. And that there's something that we like about some of these heroes that are tricky and um, take advantage of the system. But I wonder if the hero archetype is factored in here. Well, that's interesting, Deb, because I'm thinking about Elizabeth Holmes, and we were fascinated with her when she was in her ascendant. Mm-hmm. You know, she she was the uh, very young Stanford dropout who uh, founded this company Theranos that was supposed to uh, have this miracle technology that could identify all these issues just with a single drop of blood. And I believe she was on, I think she was on the cover of all kinds of big magazines. I'm thinking maybe one of them was Forbes and maybe maybe even the Sunday Times magazine section. And she was very striking. She had blonde hair and she always wore a black turtleneck. And, w- you know, we just, she, she was the darling and we just couldn't get enough of her. And there were all these articles about this, this wonderful new company, Theranos. And then when it was revealed that the whole thing was essentially a scam, that we couldn't get enough of her then either. So whether it's yeah. this heroic story mm-hmm. of a kind of unlikely success and uh, this this wonderful kind of American, in particular, this uh, American fascination that we have with the the ability to sort of create something from nothing, you know, that a kind of trickster hero, or whether we're fascinated by the darker side of that, that this this wasn't. This wasn't a, a trickster hero like, for example, Steve Jobs, who who created something out of nothing, and and it was this amazing thing that we all love, but instead it was it was just a, a scam version of that. That's also fascinating. I could not get enough of that story. I listened to the podcast and I read the book and I watched yes. the HBO special yes. and yeah, I was fascinated. So there, she was a kind of heroine. Uh, she went to Stanford. She had all kinds of uh, very famous, well-known officials and heads of corporations and so on on her board. And we wanted to believe the story, the narrative of beautiful young woman who's simply brilliant, can come up with uh, sort of this 
it's not a rags to riches story, but it is sort of a, you know, bursting into full bloom like Athena from the head of Zeus. And we wanted to believe the fairy tale. And then we were intrigued when it went wrong and it turned out to be a scam. One of the things that I was thinking about when you were comparing Steve Jobs to Elizabeth Holmes is that comparison between Prometheus and the trickster. And one could make an argument that Prometheus did trick the gods. He stole fire from the gods and gave it to human beings, although he is conceived more as a savior from the standpoint of the humans and a trickster from the standpoint of the Olympians, where Elizabeth Holmes has a different kind of flavor to her. But there is this strange dance between the trickster and the savior, depending on who's the recipient of the benefit. I think this is really interesting, though, because I think that we can see trickster in service to a heroic goal. So we can see trickster as a culture hero. And there is some trickiness involved in someone like Steve Jobs or anyone who comes up with a brilliant new idea. There's definitely a a little wisp of trickster in that, especially, I think, in the field of technology. I mean, that is, technology is the realm of Hermes. But it can also be in this more shadowy, sociopathic, darker vein, where the trick is in service only to personal aggrandizement. With today's topic, we're more leaning into the second thing there. Where the benefit is really just for the the one who is doing the tricking, the personal benefit, and then we can't lay a kind of savior or heroic dimension on it. But it takes advantage of that pattern that we recognize, that archetype of the hero, of the culture hero, because that's what we all thought Elizabeth Holmes was or Sam Bankman-Fried, we thought, wow, look at this person, look at what they're bringing to society. They are, look at the, you know, they're, they're a savior. I mean, Elizabeth Holmes was going to rescue all these people from medical issues. You know, she was going to change medical treatment. And Sam Bankman-Fried, you know, he declared the whole purpose of his organization was to uh, make money for effective altruism, that he was going to give something like $5 billion to uh, various worthy causes to benefit humanity. But I'm also aware in our culture, uh, we really value personal achievement and individual success. That aspect of the hero archetype, unlike Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods to benefit human beings, We really value people who can burst uh, into success with lots of money, lots of fame, a whole new entrepreneurial ideal, that this is some kind of American myth. And so that value creates a kind of fertile field for certain people. Exactly. The culture uh, sort of prepares the field for someone to come in and grow uh, fairly, fairly easily, and fairly quickly. Of this is part of an American mythological substrate. It's very hard to resist it. I mean, uh, e- Elizabeth Holmes enlisted the aid, support, directors, patronage of a lot of very successful, knowledgeable people. Sam Bankman Freed also. I mean, his. his parents are professors. Um, We want to believe this because it's a cultural norm. I imagine other cultures that don't value individual stardom and heroism as much as we do uh, wouldn't have as fertile a field for this to take root and, and spring into bloom. I think that in the United States, we have a particularly complicated gestalt because Many of the things that have been achieved in Western culture did seem like magical thinking in the beginning. Like the telephone seemed ridiculous, that people could speak over a copper wire, or that a medicine could cure a terrible disease, or that any number of innovations would save us all in one way or another. So we might say that 
magical thinking in and of itself, from a Freudian standpoint, is a defense against existential horror, and that when we get promises that we will be relieved of some awful circumstance, part of us wants to believe that we're going to get away, you know, from something terrible. But because sometimes we have been able to do that, Mm -hmm. it creates this field where we're not quite sure if the miraculous claim is sometimes actually going to pan out or whether it's ridiculous and even dangerous to align with. That creates a, a more difficult field of discernment. Whether it's going to be a jack and the beanstalk, and there really is treasure to be had, or, you know, whether this is, uh, you know, basically a scam. But one way or another, as ever, uh, we or other people are complicit. It It takes both. It takes, you know, the person with the, the magical, wonderful idea And then it takes other people to jump in and believe it, be complicit, support it, or really vet it, really investigate. And so as we're talking, I'm beginning to sense that the scam artist could be involved in any number of different archetypes. That one easy character to lay in that is the idea of the trickster. But when I think about the sophistication of much of the scams, I don't know that it has that same trickster archetype in it. I mean, in one way, the trickster is in service to life mm-hmm. in as much as nature is constantly tricking, trapping other life forms to eat them, to keep things going along. Plants masquerade themselves as one thing or another. Animals like a trigger fish has a little worm-like appendage off the top of its head, making it look like a worm and gobbles up things that come towards it. So this idea of being cunning and tricksy is something we just see in nature as a survival technique. I also think that when human beings are put in intense survival circumstances, being tricky becomes a way of surviving, whether we're uh, in in a war zone, and people have to be incredibly cunning in order to survive, wearing costumes, pretending they're one thing, well, maybe they're not. People escape Nazi Germany sometimes by dyeing their hair blonde, finding German clothing, and sneaking through borders. I mean, that was a life-saving uh, costuming, and the incredible danger that people were in brought the trickster forward to save, uh, to save life. So there's one balance there. When I think about the scam artist, I suppose people who think that they're in a survival mode are willing to play tricks in the marketplace to be able to get enough food and resources for their family in desperate circumstances. But sometimes a scam artist really is a psychopath. Yes. Um, that there's something else going on that's really, it's not quite as life-affirming, let's say, as Trickster is. Right. That kind of scam artist, the, the Machiavellian or the psychopath or antisocial personality disorder, is intentional from the beginning of, I'm going to trick you, take you, I'm going to take you to the cleaners. And Bernie Madoff apparently was uh, in that category that he knew uh, for decades uh, that that he had a Ponzi scheme and that he was ripping people off. And at the very end, uh, apparently, he talked to his family, his sons and his wife and some close associates and said, it's all over now. It's all collapsing. And it was a Ponzi scheme. And... And now uh, we've come to an end. So he fits that category of just in it for myself uh, and um, fully intending to do nothing but rip people off. But I wonder if some of the others are really fit more into the category of, of just a narcissism, having those characteristics of, of entitlement, needing admiration, needing the success needing to be important, 
and having a kind of inflation that I'm different and I'm special and I, I somehow can get away with this and that what I want to have happen will happen and a kind of denial uh, because of this inflation. Yeah, I'm really appreciating, uh, Deb, you bringing up inflation and, and just, and it does go with narcissism, this sense that things can't go wrong for me somehow. Uh, I remember when I was uh, listening to the podcast on Elizabeth Holmes, it was called The Dropout. They told this story that was actually fairly sympathetic, that when she was in high school, I think she was running track or playing field hockey or something, I don't remember, but the coach or something was interviewed and said that Elizabeth was just one of the hardest workers she'd ever seen, that you know she didn't have a lot of natural talent at the sport, but she just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and wouldn't quit, and it was like she just mm-hmm. didn't she was sort of impervious to this critique that, you know, she, she wasn't, she wasn't very good. And I thought, Oh, okay, well, that's something I thought that was positive. And it was certainly portrayed relatively positively. Then recently, I was listening to another podcast about another scam artist, you can see how much this fascinates us all. The podcast is is called Dr. Death. And it profiled this Texas neurosurgeon named Christopher Dunch. And he was eventually tried for, and I believe um, convicted of murder, not malpractice, but murder. So there were 31 patients who were left seriously injured after he operated on them, and two of them died. And he was a doctor, um, but he wasn't very competent. And he clearly had uh, grandiose views of his own abilities in the operating room. So he would go operate on someone and then there would be just a horrible outcome. It, it, was, it was just the reason he was tried for murder is it didn't even look like he was trying to do the operation correctly. It, it's, it's just gruesome. But, but then he would just go right in and operate on the next person, even after knowing that he was causing harm to people. So in, in that podcast, they were, he had been a football player. And they interviewed, you know, someone that knew him on the football team in high school or college or something. And it was a very similar story to the one about Elizabeth Holmes, that he wasn't any good, but he worked and 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 worked. worked. Didn't really get much better, but he continued working, 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 working. This time it was a little bit less glowing, the report, but I recognized the pattern and I was fascinated. And I thought, is it something about being unable to recognize your own limits? Mm-hmm. That that you just, it just doesn't occur, you know, you're so impervious in a way to failure, you know, and of course, I, I'm so familiar in my consulting room with people who kind of have the opposite problem with those of us who are more on the kind of typical neurotic spectrum, who when we face a small setback, we feel defeated, and we don't pick up and dust ourselves off and try again. But but this is, this is the, the kind of grit to a truly pathological level that you aren't able to see when what you're doing isn't working or you're no good at it or, or it's harming someone. Well, I think this goes to the topic of inflation when there is some kind of an archetypal matrix that is informing the psyche. And so we believe that we have merit or quality or attributes that we really cannot demonstrate, which is central, as you had said, to narcissism to really deep pathologic narcissism. So people will make up things on their resume, show up, and out of pure charisma, be able to pull together a certain amount of interest in them. But then they're kind of imposters. In that way, there's a trickster. There's a costuming that's being held by the archetype and that people can't actually demonstrate or have never demonstrated the things that they're claiming to be able to do. And that from the standpoint of the narcissistic disorder, that the true center of the self or the true ego is so undeveloped, so broken, so damaged that it is not capable of engaging life in a way that is effective and real. And so there's an archetypal compensation. So the severe narcissist has a kind of um, stage proxy. Mm. Some say the false self, which comes forward and and does not have the kinds of talents that it wants to be seen as having. And so consequently, it creates tragedy when any trust is placed in it. So inflation in that regard is life-threatening. It's the as-if personality, isn't it? 
in some of these cases? The psychopath, I think, is darker in as much as there is an implacable hunger that the psychopath exists in a kind of chronic lacuna. And lacuna is a wonderful old term of just absence, that there's a kind of absence of self. And that absence, as the psychopath matures, becomes increasingly more painful, agonizing, frightening. And then there's a pursuit for any kind of sensation that can distract the ego from the feeling of horror uh, and annihilation. So in that way, people will pursue increasingly dangerous schemes and scams in order to create a distracting magnetic center. And as soon as that becomes old hat, then the stakes have to be elevated even higher. So then this may have something more to do with the financial scamming, that there just aren't billions enough of dollars to actually offset the internal emptiness and horror of that. So the risks somehow seem justified. I can also imagine that there is a kind of gradation uh, leading up to, you know, what turns out to be a monumental scam like Bernie Madoff or uh, Elizabeth Holmes. And I'm thinking we're seeing one right now. It's right in the news with this congressman, uh, George Santos, oh, yes, who yes. Um, says that he embellished uh, his his yeah. resume. But what I'm imagining, this is my fantasy, is that he, like many, many people, all of us really, wanted to be seen as someone special. And so he tweaked it a little bit and got away with it. And so another tweak or two, and then it sort of it took off on its own because it worked and it fulfilled his own vision of himself as heroic and as special. And that as if personality, the false self or imposter, we are happy to don that kind of clothing and be take on that role of um, all things to everyone or the financial wizard or uh, technological genius. We find a, we, I wonder if we wind up or people like him wind up being uh, victims of their very own scam. Well, in that way, we're talking about shadow, which sometimes is golden shadow, that there is this unrealized potential that then does come forward, but is not necessarily merited. So his aspiration to be a successful mm -hmm. scholar, for instance, a successful student, then gets to put forward in this false veneer, this golden veil. It is a, a maladaptive way of trying to put hands on this potential, but in a way that, of course, tricks the trickster. We all wind up getting in trouble, not always, but sometimes under excessive scrutiny. And that's really present in the Native American stories of the trickster, particularly, that Jung was very um, delighted by. That the trickster would often be full of himself and then do some kind of silly action, which then causes him to get ill or be injured and then need a bunch of help. And these were kind of comedic stories uh, in the Native American tribes that were telling them, but they were also life lessons. Uh, like European fairy tales, there were instructions about the danger of kind of taking on these ridiculous claims of, for oneself. You know, Deb, you were kind of describing this slippery slope kind of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and, and Joseph, you, you linked it to shadow, which I think is just right. And I think we can all relate to that, that sometimes we're maybe a little bit at the edge of something. Mm hmm. And, and it works and we get rewarded and then we're able to tell ourselves, well, it's okay. You know, this, this is okay. We can normalize things and then we take it a step further and you wonder how far down the track you can get with that and, well, until you're just way in over your head. I mean, I, I wonder if that were a little bit the case with uh, Elizabeth Holmes, that she, she had this good idea she got all of this backing. She was very young. 
And she probably just convinced herself that it was going to work. One of the interesting things that I remember reading is that um, talking about uh, sort of medical uh, medical technology, it's very different than, say, developing a new software, because the 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 whole gestalt in Silicon Valley is a little bit like this trickster scammer sensibility in that you float a big idea, say, for a, a new a new software, and you get the backing, and then you build it. And you probably can, but you don't have it built when you go out and tell everyone how great it is and everyone gives you money. But uh, software is this sort of fungible thing in which something is inevitably going to be possible. But that's not true with something like testing blood. It's much more bounded by, you know, sort of Saturnian limitation and just the hard edge of reality. So uh, it, 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 is, it was a climate, though, that rewarded, Joseph, I think what you were talking about, that the, the trickster overextends himself sometimes. And that high wire place of being out there, being really audacious, getting a little bit ahead of your skis, that is an exciting place to be in. And it can be a very generative place. But sometimes we wind up just a little bit too far down the branch and it breaks off. And one of the key elements, according to Jung, is that the trickster is unrelated. That there's something about the other people that are involved that don't make sense to the trickster archetype. There's several um, things that Jung says in uh, volume 9, 1, And on the trickster, he says, although he is not really evil, he does the most atrocious things from sheer unconsciousness and unrelatedness. So there's something about being driven by unconscious factors of all kinds. And I think one could take any one of the trickster stories that we're talking about or the scam stories and wonder which particular archetype possessed them, and that there's something about being captured by unconscious material that makes other people seem not quite real. And then, consequently, the consequences for the other person don't seem real either, until it all comes crashing down, of course. So the one one aspect of uh, this kind of scam artist is a person who really has a lot of shadow and a tremendous complex about needing to be seen as wonderful and special and a great need to be admired. And as Jung says, not really evil, but does the most atrocious things from sheer unconsciousness. And so they believe in they believe their own scam, which probably makes it, you know, all the more credible to others. And I suspect um, this is my own fantasy that this congressman George Santos came to believe those things. Uh, I think it was um, it's a Dickens in in David Copperfield who says uh, something to the effect of wanting to be the hero. We all want to be the hero of our own lives, I'm paraphrasing. And that there is something very seductive about that. I I want to be the person who invents this incredible thing or can be all things to all people. Um, That I was at the top of my class and I did go to a prestigious university. And yet it really illustrates, you know, how dangerous this kind of shadow can be for the perpetrator and for the people that he or she takes advantage of. There is a cost often at the end. And Jung says something um, at the end of his essay on the trickster that I think is has a bit of hope to it. If at the end of the trickster myth, the savior is hinted at, this comforting premonition or hope means that some calamity or other has happened and been consciously understood, 
Only out of the disaster can the longing for the Savior arise. In other words, the recognition and unavoidable integration of the shadow create such a harrowing situation that nobody but a Savior can undo the tangled web of fate. In the case of the individual, the problem constellated by the shadow is answered on the plane of the anima, that is, through relatedness. So, when we are brought low by a misrepresentation, let's say, on our resume, which then we're exposed and we can't produce the goods that we claimed to, and all of a sudden we're confronted, perhaps we're being released from employment. I mean, it's a mess, it's humiliating, painful, and if there is a self-reflective process, if one can be committed to understanding how, why, what happened such that one added this, you know, scheme, this, this storyline to the resume, we could then long for some intervention of the self. Mm-hmm. We could long that for something to help us from within and out of that become aware that we are in a web of life and relationships that had we been more transparent about our need to know something more or even to train in something that we knew would help us get a better job, we could have asked other people for help. We could have actually been in relationship to the resources in the environment and out of those relationships acquired the things that we actually did need to make good on our promises. Part of the trickster is the fantasy that we're all alone and nobody will help us. And then we have to rely on any desperate measure to kind of get by. Or at least the trickster makes us think that. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that that's the positive aspect of the trickster is, trickster is the belief that we can manage this ourselves and we can find the way out. We can come up with a creative solution. There are times when that is accurate and adaptive. And there are times, like you're saying, Joseph, when the trickster pulls us into thinking that way, and it's not really true. And then we're driven to these desperate ploys that wind up being harmful to everyone. And I suspect that may be a key to the sort of slippery slope of Mm -hmm. a person who believes that it is all on me and I have to do it and I don't need anybody else, or that there is perhaps shame in having to ask for help uh, that may be related to personality, upbringing, history, and, and all the rest of it. And that then that builds on itself, that I am the world unto myself and to turn to others Uh, is not an option that I have. And then what happens? Um, When this uh, proverbial house of cards collapses, can the person uh, acknowledge his or her own shadow uh, through remorse and through guilt and be brought low? Or does the person have to persist in this kind of inflated place and blame others or provide uh, justifications and excuses to maintain this false self and a kind of unconsciousness, especially of shadow. Which brings up for me something about the idea of gold. We sell fool's gold, perhaps because we haven't found our own real gold. So, for instance, something that's common enough in college as kids plagiarize. They won't cite something. And colleges take it very seriously. Sometimes you just get a warning. Sometimes you can be terminated from an entire program or from the the university. Plagiarizing used to happen probably more easily. Now kids upload their papers to these search engines that can tell the teacher in a few seconds whether or not a sentence has been lifted from another document without being cited properly. But it's It's a small manifestation of trickster where 
we're going to take someone else's gold and make it seem like it's ours. But that's an avoidance of the real task, which is, where's my gold? Where are my insights? Where, how do we convince the student that they do have golden insights that would be valued by the instructor, that would allow them to be seen, graded well, supported, developed, and that they would be acknowledged for the gold that they bring forward. So that brings up two dynamics. One is, have we been raised in environments where bringing forward our own gold was somehow dangerous or mistreated or we were somehow had a bad experience so that we hide our gold away by the time we're in young adulthood 1920, we're in college. We don't even know how to find our own insights because we've spent so much time being trapped in the mirror, being a narcissistic object for somebody else so that we're constantly feeding somebody back their own opinions, being whatever they think we should be. So our own gold is somehow lost to us. That's one way that we can lose our gold. And then by the time we're in college, We're constantly looking to mirror somebody else's gold as if it's ours. Universities will have a tendency to punish kids for doing that, but I also think there's a lack of insight. There's a reason that kid thought that's the only way that you can find gold is because they were probably taught that in their home. You're only going to be valued for repeating what your caregivers like, want, and say. So why wouldn't you continue doing that professionally? And that kind of narcissistic wounding can push people into that kind of trickster behavior because it's rewarded and normalized, but more importantly, because it's alienated them from themselves. I want to just lean into another piece of that, though, because I I like your analogy of the plagiarizing. I I think that's, that's good for talking about the scam artist. But part of what goes into that is the kid would not just have to value his own gold. He would have to sit down and read the book and write the paper. (laughs) Like there's just a certain kind of elbow grease. Sure. And there is a tendency. I mean, that's a big part of trickster is just let me get away with what I can get away with. And sometimes that's uh, let me get away with, you know, not really doing the work. So what do we think that's about? That interference with finding our, our inner industry our our muscularity. Well, I'm relating it to persona and uh, developing that presentation, uh, the patina of being successful, competent, pleasing to others. That takes an external orientation to the world. I, how do other people see me? Uh, rather than uh, having a sense of of inner competence and inner worth and inner authenticity that says, I think I'll read the book. Um, I'm going to have to hunker down and and do the hard work, but I can, uh, and I want to, and I'm curious, uh, versus being oriented to what will the professor think? What will my classmates think? What will my parents think? I need to bring home a good report card. I think we're in the realm of inflation, that it mm-hmm. just is simply, I would rather go out and drink with my buddies than sit my butt down in the chair and read the book. <laughs> I mean, obviously not in every case, but I, I think that that informs informs a, a lot of this attitude, that somehow there's an almost a sense of entitlement, like I should be able to get through this without really doing any difficult work. Well, then we're in the puer and the puella, mm-hmm. yeah, and in the realm of the mother, it should be given to me, either the unconscious will just give me whatever I need to know and I can just bring that forward. But the puer puella feels that hard work is beyond them. They're too young. They're, they should be having fun. It should come easily. So so we're, we're in this realm of uh, the, the dependent narcissist, you know, very charming, very likable. It's just all going to come my way and it should. I mean, I I do think that was active in Elizabeth Holmes, or at least I'm in my fantasy. When I think about the um, fantastical element of it, 
the the Peter Pan ish, so to speak. It's very flying and magical, and that somehow these outcomes will magically appear. Yes, um, from someone. Um, apparently, she didn't have the wherewithal to generate these things, but somebody will bestow them. Mm-hmm. I mean, that I think is part of that mother fantasy that the great mother, the cosmic mother, will somehow make this happen. And all I need to do is be enthusiastic and uh, hopeful for it. So people can get caught in that kind of innocence. And of course, we, we look like adults, and so people treat us like adults with that level of responsibility. The puer puel is tough, isn't it? I mean, von Franz says that the cure is you know, hard work for hard work's sake. But that transition, that's a hard sell. <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, if you can just download a paper off the internet, you know, if you thought you could get away with it, you know, why, so why would you read the book? You know, why, why not go hang out with your buddies and get stoned? I'm sorry, I'm really sounding very Saturnine, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're making a case for just downloading the paper, perhaps, or having some like AI, uh, right? Well, app that's, that's a whole, paper for that's you, a whole thing. Is a whole this, is, this is really thing. kind of scary, but um, yeah, artificial intelligence, but no, the but, genie. but but hard work for hard work's sake is so rewarding, though. And it's you're not in the as if realm, you've really done something. You've, you've created new knowledge within yourself. You've opened new storerooms of ideas. You've changed yourself a little bit because you read the book and really digested it. Or didn't completely understand it and that that's okay. You wrestled with it. I'm going back to the idea of, you know, is my world external in what other people think of me, the kind of grades I get, the promotion I need to have the corner office or do i have an interior world am i really real inside do i matter to me and what i have learned and can digest be puzzled by be confused by but i am here and i matter versus that external orientation where it's the external trappings of success and admiration that, that really matter. And that's what I think is so very sad about this, is the internal emptiness of this essential kind of narcissistic uh, orientation where there is no, there's no there there. There's not enough me inside uh, any given person. They're shaped by other people's opinions, what kind of car they have, how much status there is. And then they're not really alive. So if there is not a, even a nascent sense of self that's available, then the pleasure of knowing and doing seems too ephemeral. Yes, exactly. Exactly. They miss the pleasure of knowing and doing and being. So we're in the realm of Pinocchio, perhaps. We should talk about that. There's a Del Toro has made a new telling of Pinocchio that is, um, in his style, has a lot more unconscious grotesqueries in it, which makes it particularly intense. But that Pinocchio does have to grow, and he also has to be more than his father's fantasy of him Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in order to be a a real boy rather than just being a a little puppet made of wood Mm -hmm. that's kind of just being moved around by unconscious factors or the wills of other people. And he has to become relational. He has to realize that Geppetto has loved him and cared about him and suffers and that that matters to him and he feels remorse Mm -hmm. uh, and guilt Uh, when he's relegated to Donkey Island and starts to grow donkey ears. So he has to develop these kinds of feelings and relatedness. Which goes back to suffering. Yep. That um, that it's, it's when he suffers, colluding with the trickster, of course, which is what happens. He's tricked into this carnival, and he's bestialized as a result, enslaved by it. That in the suffering 
that we long to be rescued, long for the Savior, and if the longing to be helped and rescued is sincere enough, then we have to break out of the encapsulated shell beyond ourselves. We have to recognize what is outside of us in order to have any hope of being saved or being positively influenced. So I I think what we're landing on is that one of the primary traits of the scam artist who employs trickster energy in this really dark way is a lack of relationality, a lack of relatedness, a lack of empathy. And part of the reason why we may find them so fascinating is because many of us are somewhat trapped by empathy. We may need a little bit of that trickster energy to be used with discernment when it is really appropriate and in service to life. Absolutely, Del McNeely writes wonderfully on that in her book on the trickster gods that as we said foremost the archetype of the trickster is in service to life particularly in unbearable circumstances the old example that was often used is that when the soviet union was still intact and the incredible oppressive process and so few goods and services were available, so many things were hyper-regulated, that it caused an enormous and vibrant black market. People just started making things on their own, importing things, selling things secretly uh, under the ground so that people's needs could be met outside of the oppression of the system. And this happens whether it's in a family or whether it's in a town or whether it's in a government life uh, will fight its way forward and that will involve a certain amount of trickiness particularly when the oppressing system is overpotent it's too much and that that requirement for trickiness will also mean that we will have to disconnect a little bit from empathy and relatedness but when that goes too far then we wind up with Elizabeth Holmes and the Sam Bankman Freeds and the Bernie Madoffs and on and on. And that may not be in essence related to survival, but some other kind of shadow process. I find myself thinking about that old movie from 1984, Footloose, uh, with star Kevin Bacon. But it was a town that had become so oppressive and so fundamentalist and dancing was outlawed. And so the kids decide that they're going to set up this secret society of dancing underneath as this subversive trickster. Now, that hardly seems destructive, but it speaks to the way trickster comes in in its delightful, subversive way so that some psychic part of the life of the kids can remain intact. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a beautiful example that we could relate to pretty easily. Everybody was cheering Kevin Bacon on (laughs) for his transgressive dancing. (laughs) But I'm thinking that this relates to um, the kinds of difficult societies that a lot of scammers live in overseas, uh, where there is poverty and uh, unfairness or oppression. And so out of desperation, um, they come up with all kinds of schemes. You know, I have been called by people who are purportedly um, the IRS, people who want me to buy some kind of lottery thing, et cetera, et cetera, and that they are simply trying to play the game that the structure of, of the world and society and capitalism, you know, seem to have laid down. And so they're just trying to make a living. Mm-hmm. And and play the game as they perceive the game has been played on them. And maybe part of the takeaway is that we all have this capacity to be tricky within us. Mm-hmm. And I bet if you think about it, you could imagine being on that slippery slope somehow. You know, just being able to maybe ignore the consequences because things are going your way. And how far down would you slide? I think we, if we're being honest, we could all imagine sliding down at least part of the way. So it's about 
bringing consciousness to ourselves and our relationship with these shadowy qualities. And before we switch to the dream, I just want to remind all of you listeners about two things. First of all, we have our Patreon where you can support us for a small amount of money each month. And uh, for, in exchange, you get our undying gratitude and you get to <laughs> submit questions and you get to submit dreams. And we actually produce short mini episodes every week for our patrons. So we'll do a patron stream or we'll answer a question. And also, if you just can't get enough of our dreams, consider joining Dream School. Dream School is our 12-month uh, program where we teach you how to work with your dreams and uh, that's an important part of getting in touch with the unconscious and really benefiting from the gifts is, is being able to work with dreams. In dream school, we walk you through it step by step. We have uh, recorded lectures and written materials, and there's a lively community. And we do three live events every month. Each one of us offers something every month so that you can be with us and learn from us. And we hope that you will check it out for either of those, you can go to our website at thisjungianlife.com. Thank you. And today's dreamer is a 44-year-old male who is a university professor. And here's his dream. I'm with my family in a grand dining room around a large table with lots of food on it. It's going to be Dad's funeral. I hear that Mum is really upset because she wants to see Dad's body before they bury him. Some men bring Dad's body directly past the table where we're sitting, and as they bring the body past, I recite the lyrics to the Kenny Rogers song, The Gambler, to my brother. I look at him sincerely, and I clearly say, On a warm summer's evening, on a train bound for nowhere, I met up with a gambler, we were both too tired to sleep. We took turns in staring out the window at the darkness until the boredom overtook us and he began to speak. He said, Son, I've made a living out of reading people's faces, knowing what the cards were by the way they held their eyes. And if you don't mind me saying, I can see you're out of aces. And for a taste of whiskey, I'll give you some advice. You've got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. You never count your money when you're sitting at the table. There'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. Now, every gambler knows the secret to surviving is knowing what to throw away and knowing what to keep. Because every hand's a winner and every hand's a loser. And the best you can hope for is to die in your sleep. Then I stop, and we start to eat the food. I had this dream a few months ago in the middle of an extremely turbulent time in my life, where I felt in crisis, lost, heartbroken, and adrift. My father died in February, and some months later, my long-term partner ended our relationship in a way that felt very brutal and painful. I felt lost, alone, afraid, and adrift, and was in the midst of this turbulence at the time of the dream. And he adds that his main feelings were, I felt like my mom, and desperate and devastated in the dream. However, as my dad's coffin went by and I started to sincerely read the lyrics of the song to my brother, there was a sense of powerful conviction and sincerity in my speech, as though I were offering profound wisdom and advice. And then he offers a few associations to his dream. My dad was never very involved in our family. We wished he'd been, but he wasn't. He was a drinker, an old rocker, a bit like the gambler in the song. I never really trusted they had much wisdom to offer me. I always assumed he didn't really care. My brother and I were close growing up, but drifted apart as adults. My brother is more like my dad than I am. He drinks parties as gregarious. I'm more reserved, careful, thoughtful, quiet, and the responsible child. And so, interestingly enough, relevant to our yes. talk about uh, trickster, the trickster and the gambler, have a bit of a dance, you know, with each other. 
We come to this dream, and I'm so impressed that he, uh, in the dream, I know. knew all the words <laughs> to this Kenny Rogers <laughs> song. That was my first thing that I was so impressed by. Yeah. Or perhaps um, <laughs> a, a little a little help later on upon reflection may have helped to flesh out some of the some of the lyrics. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes you, you know, I think we've all had that experience where we're just in reverie about something, and a song comes into our mind, mm-hmm. yep. and we realize when we think about the lyrics that the unconscious produced the song. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a little commentary on our psychic situation. So here that yep. is happening in a dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. The unconscious is listening to everything, even though the ego <laughs> you isn't. You can't get away <laughs> from it. It's sobering, yeah. I, I'm kind of making a, a sort of mental set of parentheses around the mm-hmm. Kenny Rogers song. So I'm starting with uh, the dreamer uh, in in a grand dining room with a table of food, And it's going to be uh, the dream ego's father's funeral. Uh, The mother wants to see him, and some men bring the body directly past the table. And then we have the whole Kenny Rogers song. And then I go to the last line of the dream, which is then I stop and we start to eat the food. So in a way, I'm kind of thinking about, well, I love the Kenny Rogers song, but I feel a little distracted by it as well, because the lyrics are pretty compelling, and uh, you know that's almost like a dream within a dream. And so I'm, uh, you know, first kind of focusing on the father's funeral uh, with the food at the dining room table, and the mother part of our dreamer, uh, a kind of anima who wants the closure of seeing the body. Uh, I think that's a ki- an interesting and poignant scene of the family gathering, eating the food, and saying goodbye. And there's no conversation in the family about what this is like. Instead, there's the Kenny Rogers song uh, as a kind of story about this. Though so, that's interesting because the, he says the Kenny Rogers song to his brother. Yes. I think I had a different uh, experience of the dream, it sounds like, than you did, Deb, because I did find the lyrics really compelling. I didn't know those lyrics particularly myself. And my fantasy about this dream, just kind of quickly and off the cuff, was that the dreamer has rejected the father. The dreamer is the responsible one. The brother is more living out the father's life. But that father stuff, that kind of gambler, trickster energy, old rocker energy, must be in the shadow for the dreamer. He says, you know, I I didn't think my father had anything to, to, to tell us. But here comes this gambler speaking through the lyrics of this song, offering really profound life advice. I mean, I, I do think you, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, know when to rock, walk away and know when to run. That's pretty good advice. And, uh, you know, and I could, I could sort of expand on that psychologically. It takes me all kinds of places, actually. And so the dream, in a way, is an invitation to get to know a little bit of the shadow father energy and recognize that there might be some wisdom there. So he, it's interesting because he's in the main feelings in the dream. He doesn't report on his feelings initially. He says, I feel like my mom was desperate and devastated. He doesn't say how he's feeling. Exactly. So he's, exactly. he's been, but he's been more in identification with his mother in my fantasy. He's been, he, and of course, who wouldn't, right? You, you, you grow up, your father's uh, deadbeat. Of course, you, you kind of take your mom's side. But that causes you not to have much of a relationship with the father qualities. And so in a, in a sense, reciting these lyrics is a way of embodying the father a little bit and perhaps getting some healthy separation from the mother, which might have been required in this real tumultuous time that he was in to establish a new stance that required him to come into contact with and forge a conscious relationship with shadow. I'm resonating with what you're both saying. One thing that comes to mind is that 
when, when the father or the mother passes away and we don't have adequate memories of that person, then the archetype generally comes in as a placeholder. So what I think I'm hearing is that with the death of the father and the unconscious is determined that the ego really accept the death, you know, the body is being moved around, which by the way is also an old European tradition, you know, in Ireland, if somebody died, you wash them, you put them in the living room, put coins over their eyes and people came over for days drinking and eating and uh, interacting. You know, there was a determination that the death would be integrated and that the dead would be honored by eating and drinking with them. So there's something um, historic about the body being present. So this archetype of the father comes forward in the Kenny Rogers song, or is offered at least, or is evoked at least, as a frame for how to hold the father, at least for now, as this wisdom figure, as a kind of sage. Mm -hmm. That's useful to him, that he gets to be the kind of wisdom figure for his brother, who I think really represents his own shadow, which you were saying, Lisa, that the brother is holding that more um, freewheeling gambler while the son is holding this more responsible, we could say Saturnine, but I would venture to say more maternal position mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. yeah. the two parts are kind of available. The mother's son. Yeah, the mother's son. The mother's holding the grief because she was attached to him as a lover, as a husband, and, and had memories of him prior, perhaps, to his... Uh, disappearing from the household for whatever reason. So there's grief, as you'd notice, which he's not able to access yet. And I'd like your um, suggestion, Deb, that the focus on the song could be a defense against the grief by you know, encapsulating in this uh, kind of archetypal uh, way of holding it. But I also want to say that um, he had been in turbulence and was heartbroken that his partner had left in a way that felt brutal and painful. So the message is also to him, no when to hold, no when to fold, no when to walk away. So it sounds like the partner who left was thinking in some ways like the gambler. From his perspective, he felt abandoned and lost like an abandoned child. But by introducing the song about the gambler, it's the beginning of maybe understanding that his partner who left was holding some of these valences of knowing when to leave that from his perspective would not have been possible for him to, to see or perceive. Well, I am wondering, I mean, uh, it's up to the dreamer, of course, to see what resonates, but I'm uh, thinking about the song that comes up from the gambler is itself a song about don't have feelings. Just know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away. Every hand's a winner, every hand's a loser. The best you can hope for is to die in your sleep. And the part of the dream where the dream ego is involved, sitting at the table with uh, the mother, with his brother, and they eat the food. I'm wondering about this dreamer's relationship to the feeling function, uh, because uh, it's the song lyrics uh, uh, that, that have some of the feeling function, but it, I think there's a lot about um, holding feeling at bay in this dream. We don't know, but it's interesting that most of the dream is a recitation of song lyrics rather than the dream ego being there experiencing a connection with the other dream figures and the action of the dream, which is the, the father's death. Although I, I just want to offer perhaps another read on that, Deb. I, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I, I think, you know, your idea that it's a defense, it, it really works for me. And he says, I've, I've been heartbroken. I have felt lost, alone, afraid, and adrift. 
he's been in feeling. And in some sense, the gambler is giving him the compensating factor for that, which is sort of toughen up a little bit. <laughs> yep. Take a larger view of it. You know, sometimes sometimes you get dealt a good hand, sometimes you don't. You got to figure out what to do with it. So I almost wonder if the unconscious is saying, okay, get out of feeling a little bit uh, that, you're, because uh-huh. you're, you're, you're kind of drowning in it. And so get a little more strategic. And it could be either one of those. And uh, it's and up to the dreamer, too. right? And yeah. it's the dreamer, right. the the dreamer will have to make the meaning of which one really resonates. Because I think that is the way it is with dreams, right? That these uh, images mm-hmm. come up, w- we can kind of land on what it might mean symbolically. It could mean this, or it could mean on the flip side, like heads and tails of a coin. And the dreamer has to know which or both, and how much of each. Yeah, and which, where it, where it kind of clicks, exactly. where it resonates. Yeah. There's also a, a differentiation in the gambler between what's private and what's in the game. There'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. So much of what's being said here is how, does, how do you present yourself in the middle of the game versus what you do privately when you're counting your losses and your wins and you're dealing with your bank. So there's a capacity to contain, which is suggested in the archetype of the gambler. You're sitting there, this incredible amount of money, professional gamblers, sometimes it's hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table, and this ability to contain one's reaction in order to be in the game of life. Kind of be so, strategic. Yes, there's, as you said, there's something to be said for him. Yes, he's feeling devastated for numbers of reasons, but that has to be able to be set aside to be in the game of life, to be in the game of relationships. But there's a time to go back in the right environment and take stock, deal with your losses, confront your failures. And so that may have something to do also with the expectations in the family around the grieving of the father's death. How much is public? How much is private? How do we deport ourselves in the game and understand that? I resonate with everything everybody has said so far. <laughs> yeah. It's an it's really interesting inter- It's a really dream. interesting dream. Absolutely. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.